Ladies and gentlemen, it is June 9th, 2022. I am Matt Polinsky. This is your weekly dose of sanity, the prevailing narrative. So it is June. We're almost into summer. And one thing that we have this summer, we don't usually have our elections. We had them in California and Los Angeles. Yes, I've been talking about this a lot. I'm sure you've had it up to here with me talking about LA and California stuff. But it's important and it's really a bellwether for a lot of things that are going on in society and culture. One person who recognized this, a political commentator named Ronald Brownstein, um, he's written forever. He used to be very much a writer for the LA Times. I remember his work when I was younger, but now he's uh, writing for CNN. Wrote a piece called California is about to experience a political earthquake. Here's why. Okay, so let's see what he thinks will be this political earthquake. An earthquake is building in Tuesday's California elections that could rattle the political landscape from coast to coast. In Los Angeles and San Francisco, two of the nation's most liberal large cities, voters are poised to send stinging messages of discontent over mounting public disorder as measured in both upticks in certain kinds of crime and pervasive homelessness. That dissatisfaction could translate into the recall of San Francisco's left-leaning district attorney, Chesa Boudin, likely by a resounding margin and a strong showing in the Los Angeles mayoral primary by Rick Caruso, a billionaire real estate developer and former Republican who has emerged as the leading alternative in the race to Democrat U.S. Rep. Karen Bass, once considered the front runner. Um, that's exactly what happened. One, Rick Caruso put in a very good showing as of today, where there's still a bunch of absentee ballots to count. Rick came in with a little over 40 percent. Um, and while while that it does not one does not win him the election outright, it still goes to the runoff in November against Karen. And you some people could point to the fact that Karen Bass at about 35 percent plus Kevin DeLeon, who's also very liberal, who came in third place, that overall the liberal Let's call it anti-Caruso vote, still uh, uh, added up to a total higher than the Caruso vote. But anyway, here's something that people forget. Uh, Caruso got into this race about three and a half months ago. He didn't even start the campaign until about mid-February. He's gone from 5% to about 42% in barely even three months. So that's definitely a bellwether. It's definitely a telling sign. But once again, most of these elections in LA and California yesterday were primaries. So they're all about leading up to the actual runoff, the actual election in November. A bunch of them are going to be a dogfight. Okay, so what was conclusory yesterday? Chesa Boudin, the San Francisco district attorney, a radical decarcerationist, any which way you slice it, very proudly states that he wants to reform the entire criminal justice system. We'll get to a little bit of his background in a second. But he got bounced and it was not close. This is San Francisco, ladies and gentlemen. This is the most liberal city, big city in America. And they voted him out two to one. He lost by over 20 points, a resounding statement in favor of a return to more common sense, traditional practices around criminal justice. Okay, so what does this mean? What happened here? Chesa Boudin. Okay, this guy, I, I, a lot of people throw around the term communist very half-heartedly. I don't. I don't like throwing around communist, socialist. I think they have loaded meanings. But this guy, this is a fairly, it's a fairly accurate description. He has been a fan of Venezuela communist uh, uh, President Hugo Chavez. He was a translator for Chavez, has written, wrote in his earlier days, um, very laudatory about Chavez. Um, and this was his, his parents are his, his mom went to jail. His parents went to jail for years. Uh, they were part of a, a liberal terrorist organization called the Weather Underground back in the 60s. Um, and they are convicted terrorists and murderers. And I would imagine that that informs Chess's thoughts on criminal justice and criminality, and essentially that criminals should not be punished. And the tried and true wisdom of protecting innocent people by incarcerating criminals is just not something he was really into. Um, let's look a little bit more at his background after law school. Uh, Boudin served as a law clerk to Margaret McCowan. In 2015, Boudin began working full-time at the San Francisco Public Defender's Office as a deputy public defender. While there, he argued on behalf of the office's clients that the California bail system is unconstitutional. Okay, so what's a bail system? It is pre-trial incarceration. So before, you have a right to a speedy trial, but before your trial, you can be incarcerated if you are a threat, uh, if you are considered, based on at least the likelihood that you are a threat to yourself or others, and that will be measured by bail, obviously higher bail um, for more serious cases and lower bail for less serious ones. But the idea being that, you know, in, in the absence of an actual trial, we have to make a determination as to we have to put some sort of consequence to a person not showing up for trial and just skipping out in between when they've been let out of prison and when their trial is. And so we attach 
bail to that. And Mr. Boudin wants to say that that is discriminatory against those who don't have financial resources because they simply can't afford bail. But that ignores the fact that the judge puts that, the judge takes that into consideration. Ability to pay is one of the factors that goes into the bail system. But hey, Chester doesn't think that bail is a good idea. I think it's also pretty telling at Boudin's election party, uh, one of his supporters led a chant of fuck the POA. What is the POA? The Police Officers Association, which fought hard against Boudin's election, which he won with only 36% of the vote because they have a ranked voting system. So he did not win a majority in the first place. And there was a low turnout election back in 2019. And uh, I don't know, you know, Boudin might have misinterpreted um, his election in that he had a mandate to go and essentially eviscerate the entire criminal justice system in the city of San Francisco. Um, but that that was what it seemed like his election signaled uh, a, a kind of real win for progressive uh, reformist district attorneys who thought there needs to be a new system in place for how we handle criminality. And they felt comfortable saying, fuck the police officers association. Seems to be a bad sign when the lead prosecutor is supposed to work in association with law enforcement to prosecute and incarcerate those that the police arrest, right, for crimes. That's the whole idea. Law and order. I'm sure you've seen the show. Cops arrest them. The DAs prosecute them. But this DA felt, you know, it's a little more of the approach of fuck the police officers association. Well, okay, well, things didn't go so well in San Francisco. There's an incredible piece on everything having to do with Boudin in this recall election called How San Francisco Became a Failed City. Um, it's by Nellie Bowles and she makes no bones about it. She says she was a, a supporter of Boudin's, that she thought this was a thrilling sign of the evolution of American society, that you know needed reform was in the works, um, and that Boudin's election was, was the signal of that. And as you can tell from the name of her piece, things did not work out as planned. Uh, her, along with a lot of other former Boudin supporters, um, have realized the error of their ways and supported the recall. Here's what Nellie Bowles had to say about it. Chessa wanted to break the cycle of recidivism by addressing the social causes of crime, poverty, addiction, mental health. Boudin was selling revolution and San Francisco was ready, in theory, but not in fact, because it turns out that the people on the left also own property and generally believe stores should be paid for the goods they sell. It has become no big deal to see someone stealing in San Francisco. Videos of crimes in process go viral fairly often. One from last year shows a group of people fleeing a Neiman Marcus with goods in broad daylight. Others show people grabbing what they can from drugstores and walking out. When a theft happens in a Walgreens or a CBS, there's no big chase. The cashiers are blase about it. Aisle after aisle of deodorant and shampoo are under lock and key. Press a button for the attendant to get your dish soap. Okay, so it seems like, and this is part of the conversation about what's the meaning of the Boudin recall, because he lost, so it, this was a landslide, he lost by over 20 points. And some people want to go with the analysis. This is not really a statement on criminal justice reform. This is just, this is confined to Chessa in particular, that he was a uniquely irresponsible and uniquely bad prosecutor. But uh, and while he was a uniquely bad prosecutor with a uniquely broken philosophy and approach towards crime and public safety, I mean, what if not if if reform is not what Chessa did, then what is reform, right? I mean, the whole idea is that you know we have a mass quote unquote mass incarceration problem, and that we we put too many people in jail, but. If you if there's a lot of crime, you got to put a lot of people in jail, right? So if you're not if you if your only goal is to reduce incarceration, then you can't be there trying to match the levels of crime to the levels of incarceration. That if there is high crime, well, you're not you're going to have to not prosecute some of it because that will inherently lead to mass incarceration. So someone needs to square that circle for me. If this is not a comment on the criminal justice system in general, then then what is it, right? If if the the reformists, if those who want criminal justice Justice reform don't want what Chesa Boudin served up, then what do they want? Because as we see, there's a lot of myths around, you know, our criminal justice system. There's a myth that there are a lot of people in prison for uh, long sentences for nonviolent drug related offenses. But that's that's simply not a fact. That's simply not true. Go and look it up. The vast majority of people in prison are either one repeat offenders or two violent offenders. So this whole idea that someone got 20 years for a dime bag without intent to sell. I mean, that's simply not true. Um, beyond that, if you want to lower, you know, as Chessa and some of his reformist DAs, particularly George. George Gascon believe that no matter how bad the crime, life sentences are simply inhumane, that even if someone committed, you know, multiple homicide, hey, you know, 20, 25 years, they've done their time. If they're on good behavior, they've shown that they should reenter society. So if you don't believe that, then what is reform? Someone needs to explain to me what criminal justice reform is if it's not getting rid of cash bail, if it's not reducing sentences even for violent criminals, if it's not treating repeat offenders as first-time offenders, because that's another thing that Boudin 
Epstein did, right? The whole idea is like, okay, you know something, your first offense, we might take it easy on you. If it's not something that re resulted in permanent damage, if it's not murder, rape, serious assault, your first offense, we're going to treat you differently as if you come back. You get one chance that's a bit of a lighter sentence. But Boudin, he would keep on charging repeat offenders as first-time offenders. So if criminal justice reform isn't that, what is it? I'm going to need someone to explain that to me. Um, beyond that, you know, people are wondering, okay, what specific, if people still want reform, then what exactly turned them off so much about Chesa Boudin? And part of it, and I think this was a lot more telling, and it goes to what Ronald Brownstein was uh, acknowledging and identifying, is a general sense of disorder, right? That between, if you look around, and it's an, a variety of factors, and here's the thing, they're not all the fault of guys like Chesa Boudin. Uh, I went to San Francisco for the first time in a while, I think in late 2016. This is before Boudin uh, uh, was uh, was elected. George Gascon was the DA at that time. I mean, I was shocked. I could not believe the degree of homelessness. I mean, and not you know necessarily these were newly gentrified areas. You know, the types of areas that yes had been relatively low income through the two you know 90s and 2000s but now had all the trendy restaurants and nightlife a lot of young people living there but like yeah i understand that those are not necessarily going to be the fanciest areas but the levels of homelessness and and disorder were just shocking right and these videos of people we all understand that some people commit crimes always have always will and some people have the intent to commit crimes but the the degree the idea is that you're going to have forces pushing back against that right the people in charge law enforcement enforcement, the district attorney, the prosecutors, that they're actually trying to oppose those who want to commit crimes and trying to protect innocent people from them. So I think it's the idea and the feeling that, okay, whether or not, you know, more people wanted, wanted and tried to commit crimes in, let's call, call it New York in 1992 when crime rates were far higher, let's say more people wanted to commit crimes. At least at, at that point, it felt like those who were in charge, um, or at least once New York elected Rudolph Giuliani and kind of turned the corner on public safety, were trying or making an attempt to oppose the people who wanted to commit crime. For people like Chesa Boudin, if you feel, if the citizens feel that those who are in charge are actually facilitating the criminals or simply not opposing them, then you're going to get this kind of reaction. And I think that's what you're seeing um, uh, specifically in regards to some of these district attorneys and just the the kind of general milieu political tenor in Los Angeles and San Francisco and that people have had enough of this. And if even we can look at crime rates and say, OK, crime was still higher 25 years ago, but you people, what we need to get crime as low as it can be. And you're not doing your job to do that. Um, a guy named Charles Fane Lehman put together a pretty good thread um, on his thoughts on Boudin and really what the this reaction was. And as he said, you know, it, it, he pointed to disorder again, a shoplifting wave, a vibrant open air drug market, the nation's largest unsheltered homeless population and endemic public drug use. Right. It's like not necessarily Chesa Boudin's full fault that there's a lot of homelessness in San Francisco, but you add the homelessness together with the fact that he's taking it so light on criminals and it gives everyone the impression that nobody's at the wheel, that they're not being represented by anybody who's trying to protect their interests. And that's what led to yesterday's result. And also a thought on that in terms of property crimes is that part of the reaction to mass incarceration of the conversation around public safety the last few years as reform has started to come up, this whole win idea behind broken windows policing and that in the early in the early to mid 90s, as we started to take a tougher stance towards crime, we started to uh, to prosecute either pro both property crimes and kind of quality of life crimes like broken windows, pr public urination, public disorder more fiercely. Right. We started to punish those more. And this whole idea that, that that's what led to mass incarceration and that it was not worth the residual effect of lower crime rates, right? Um, so, okay, is are people now buying that? Everyone started to talk about that. It was a popular sentiment in, let's call it, during the Donald Trump years in the late 2010s that, wait a second, we went too far, we incarcerated too many people, property crimes aren't necessarily, you know, don't necessarily have victims and we can't be locking people up for five years for stealing a bike or something like that. Billy Binion of reason seems to believe that once the reality of taking it easier on property crimes came about that people rejected that right so as he says one of Chesa Boudin's biggest mistakes and a problem with progressive prosecutors generally is the notion that property crimes are victimless property rights are human rights they are just as if not more important for people struggling to get by as they are for the rich right you're a person who's you don't have a car you just have a bicycle your bicycle gets stolen well listen you want the per, you want a, a deterrent effect there you want a person to be concerned about 
being punished for stealing your mode of transportation, right? But the whole, oh, well, if we, we got to get incarceration numbers down, we can't, we can't continue with the era of quote unquote mass incarceration. So the person who stole your bike, as long as they return it or they give you 300 bucks to go get a new bike, we're not going to put them in jail. Well, it seems once again, the reality of this has not tasted as well as the as it had, was in theory. That everybody prancing around during the late 2000s and around Black Lives Matter during the 2020 uh, uh, protests and riots. That we need to rethink these things. Well, once uh, people got a, a taste of the reality of okay, we're not going to put people in jail for property crimes, for stealing bikes, for stealing stuff from CVS. Once the reality set in, they have rejected it, and that was manifested through the recall of Chesa Boudin. So let's take a moment to talk about the modern newsroom, the modern legacy media. Earlier today, a guy, a guy I follow on Twitter, Isaiah Carter, always an interesting follow, tweeted out, We are being ruled by weak, antisocial, narcissistic, emotionally disordered people who are afraid of their own fucking shadows. I'm tired of this shit, and you should be too. Okay, what was he talking about? Have you guys been following this drama, this saga going on at the Washington Post the last couple days? Are you familiar with a writer named Felicia Somnez? She is a political writer for the Washington Post. I first encountered this young lady. Uh, uh, right after Kobe Bryant died. And when I say right after, I mean literally within about an hour. Within an hour of Kobe Bryant and his 13-year-old daughter dying in a fiery blaze in a helicopter accident, Felicia Somnez, feminist queen of the jungle, felt that it was her duty, it was her job, and she was going to do a right by society by tweeting out a story about Kobe Bryant's rape case, uh, Kobe Bryant's disturbing rape case, the DNA evidence, the accuser story, and half confession. Essentially making sure that everybody in the throes of this tragedy, you know, re was reminded, hey, you know, you can't be sympathetic. You cannot feel bad. Do not grieve for Kobe Bryant because he was problematic, even though he had been cleared of that entire case. It was about 17 years ago. She felt that it was the right time to be talking about Kobe Bryant's rape case. She was ceremoniously suspended by the Washington Post for a month for that, but she did not go quietly into the night. She went not, would not stop complaining that she was being oppressed, that this was another instance of, of sexism, of misogyny, and she was being punished by the patriarchy because she was suspended for essentially shitting on Kobe Bryant with it while his body was still smoldering at the bottom uh, with his daughter at the bottom of a canyon. Okay, Felicia, see, she somehow, despite the, the kind of low threshold for cancellation or termination these days, she somehow survived that controversy and even continued to lambast her employer um, and criticize her employer for it for quite a while now. So she popped up again this week. I don't know if you're familiar with the political writer at the Washington Post named Dave Weigel. You know, he's sometimes interesting. He's got kind of an irreverent take on politics. I think sometimes he's a little too, as we'll see, a little too conciliatory and, and dismissive of the problems with modern media um, and the Washington Post. But overall, he's OK. Anyways, er, last week, he retweeted a tweet that was out there. Here's the tweet. Uh, the tweet went, every girl is bi. You just have to figure out if it's polar or sexual. Obviously, ha ha. I don't even think that's a, a really a great joke. I mean, it was a you could maybe claim that it was in bad taste for this guy to retweet that, but clearly kind of a tongue in cheek, lighthearted joke. Felicia Somnes, whoo, she did not take too kindly to that. To Dave Weigel, her colleague, who might I add, Dave Weigel defended Felicia Somnes. He tweeted out support of uh, support of her in response to her suspension in uh, in response to the Kobe Bryant incident. Felicia Somnes, instead of handling this privately, going to her employer. Off Twitter, she tweeted out in response to Weigel, fantastic to work in a news outlet where retweets like this are allowed. Okay, so she aired the Washington Post dirty laundry. In response to that, you know, Weigel took down the post. He gave a groveling apology. Um, turns out he gets suspended for a month. Felicia Somnes, she has not been satisfied by that at all. Literally, if you go to her, her profile, you go to her Twitter feed, it has been a week now of her incessantly tweeting out about how she is a victim, about how she cannot believe that the Washington Post allows her workplace to be this boiling cauldron of sexism and misogyny and the patriarchy still at play. I mean, she's nonstop. And in response, obviously, at some point, those higher ups at the Washington Post have said, OK, well, maybe other people, uh, other people. First of all, her colleagues at the Washington Post have very politely, incredibly politely just tweeted out to her. Maybe it's time to lay off here. Maybe one disparaging your employer, those that you work with. Hey, it was just a joke. This does not mean that, you know, essentially your boss, the Washington Post smacked your ass and told you to go make him a cup of coffee. OK, that's not what happened here. But Felicia, she is not having it. She continues on this tirade um, about how she is being fought. Misinformation is being spread about her and its abuse. And this is what it's like to be a woman in 2020 nonstop. 
So this is very telling. How on earth does the Washington Post let this go on? The Washington Post and internal memos have leaked um, with editor Sally Busby of the Washington Post trying to send out saying, hey, we would like to handle these matters in house. We take uh, claims of an uncomfortable workplace very seriously, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, let's try to handle these things in house. Felicia Somnes essentially embarrasses and mocks her editor, mocks her employers um, in response to any admin admonition that how dare you tell her to stop uh, responding to this torrent of abuse that is raining down upon her. Certainly not that she, you know, brought upon herself for being a complete cry bully of trying to bully her, one of her colleagues and bully everyone who seemed to think that her activities were in bad taste. It's not that it pinpoint meets the definition of what Isaiah Carter mentioned earlier, that we were being ruled by weak, antisocial, narcissistic, emotionally disordered people. That's certainly couldn't describe Felicia, nor the prevailing ethos at a newsroom like the Washington Post. This is pathetic. I'd like to kind of you know, revel and mock the Washington Post and get some enjoyment out of seeing it, you know, because listen, this is this has become a complete pile on. It's Felicia. It's colleagues of hers. It's the editor. And all this is being aired. All this dirty laundry is being aired in plain view. And it's completely embarrassing for what's supposed to be a pretty, you know, respectable and sense making institution. It's the institution that broke Watergate for crying out loud. But it's descended in some sort of child middle school antics, and that's how Barry Weiss described it. Her piece, The Washington Post, Descent into Middle School Antics. As Barry describes it, it began with a joke. Actually, it was a retweet of a joke. The Washington Post political reporter retweeted the following joke this past Friday. Every girl is bi. You just have to figure out if it's polar or sexual. I know what you're thinking. Call the police on this man immediately. I mean, oh my God, the world, the sky is falling in response to that kind of, you know, I don't even find the joke that funny. Whatever. Weigel apologized for the offensive joke later the same day. I apologized and did not mean to cause any harm, but it was already too late. His colleague, Felicia Sanmez, had seized on the tweet, starting a public shaming of Weigel as a sexist. She spent the past few days reposting others, calling her a hero, slamming one colleague who was silly enough to defend Weigel, posting about that colleague and tagging the bosses. This is what she's, this is actually going on. On Twitter, from a Washington Post political reporter like she's 15 years old. Oh, and, thro and throwing the editors under the bus repeatedly. Like, uh, there's got to be some sort of order. There must be some sort of chain of command of hierarchy where you cannot just go and bully your bosses in front of everyone under the threat, under the moral blackmail of being of them being called sexist or creating a hostile workplace for so uh, those who are supposedly marginalized. And can another, if you're able to go bully people like this, how on earth do you consider yourself, how do you claim to be marginalized you're clearly the one exercising the power, as Sanmez is in this instant. As Barry goes on, never mind collegiality or handling minor disputes privately. Never mind that Weigel quickly took down the post and apologized for the poor taste. Never mind that they were friends and he had actually signed on to a petition in support of her as she geared up to sue the paper for discrimination. It was Dave Weigel's time to be punished. That's that's how these modern newsrooms operate, folks. This is how liberal. Listen, I, I don't want to just pile on one side, but Jesus Christ, these newsrooms are overwhelmingly liberal and they overwhelmingly operate like this. I wish I could say I was surprised by how how this is playing out. But no, these institutions now let bad faith, narcissistic personality disorder, dripping with personality disorder freak shows like Felicia Sanmez essentially dictate the morality. They get to bully everyone and there's no recourse whatsoever. Is, does she get reprimanded? Does she get punished or disciplined whatsoever? I mean, up till about, God, 2014, you get uh, the boot in two seconds. But they're so scared. I mean, they're going to win any lawsuit. I have no doubt she, you could pay her, you know, offer her severance if there's a severance in her contract. If it's an at-will contract, you don't have to prove uh, any, you know, she's more than proven that she deserved to be fired. But no, they're so scared of these cry bullies kind of painting them with the label of insensitive or sexist or God knows what, no matter how frivolous and ridiculous the claim that Felipe, people like Felicia Sanmez get to go around, prance around and bully their bosses like this. And it is absolutely pathetic. And once again, as I was saying, while on the one hand, I'd like to get a kick out of this. This is really a bad sign. It's a bad indicator for where our culture's at and where once it's sense making institutions, people rely on the Washington Post to do good work, to scour the news, to pr portray truth, to break stories. They rely on this institution for that and it's no longer trustworthy it's a joke now it's a middle school it's a chaotic middle school joke 
So time does certainly fly, particularly these days in the era of the short attention span. Everybody remember that whole Ukraine-Russia conflict? Well, it's still going on, and it's four months in, and this thing that was on everybody's mind, it was the top of the news cycle, top of everybody's consciousness, top of a lot of social media pages with Ukrainian flags and things of that nature, all through February and March seems to have faded from consciousness, but this thing is still going on. And it's odd because four months is not really a long time for a war, for a military conflict, if you look throughout history, but we're in month four, and it seems like everyone has seemingly forgot about it, at least in terms, it's not it's not top of conscious. It might be having residual effects, which I'll get to in a second, but people aren't talking about it anymore. And in terms of judging um, both the Ukraine-Russia conflict itself and you know how America's strategic interests are served or not served by it, um, I think it's time to start looking at the scorecard a little bit. I had Sam Oboria on uh, at, towards the beginning of the conflict. He's a specialist in this area, and he said, hey, you know, don't overreact too much to what's going on right now. This type of conflict, as he said, moves at the speed of tanks, not tweets, essentially saying that, yes, while the initial Russian military uh, uh, initial military performance was underwhelming and seemed to kind of belie some of the assumptions about how this thing would play out, that, you know, this, the Russians, historically, Putin and, and the Russian military, They've got a lot of stamina. They uh, can win battles of attrition. And, you know, we're going to have to be in this one for the long haul. So we're four months in and let's kind of, you know, I think it's time to tally up a bit of the scorecard. So looking just at the American situation for a moment, um, one thing that we have to acknowledge that a lot of people seem to acknowledge is that our energy policy is very much dependent on Russia, as I think it was the third top oil producer and at both the American economy and the Western European economy. And Vladimir Putin knew this by ramping up oil by making the West reliant on his oil production for many years because he's been thinking about this conflict for a long time. So the oil situation, the energy situation in the United States is not looking good. So we're approaching $5 for a gallon of gas here in the United States. That would be a record. We're at record prices right now. Today in Los Angeles, I paid over $7 uh, per gallon. I mean, it, this is insane, right? And this is becoming the new normal. This is massive inflation in a core staple item of every person, something that the vast majority of the population cannot ignore. So this is certainly a leverage point for Vladimir Putin, and everyone seems to just kind of gotten used to it, um, or it's been manifested in other ways that we've got this crazy and, you know, uh, hasn't been seen in 30 years, levels of inflation, partially because of gas prices, and nobody seems to be connecting it to the Russia-Ukraine conflict anymore. Now, this is despite the fact that our politicians outright said higher oil prices were a price that we needed to pay in order to defend our values and assist the Ukraine, things of that nature. Nancy Pelosi, I mean, she came out, right? And said it. She said, let me be clear. The United States need not choose between our democratic values and our economic interests. The, uh, the administration and Congress remain laser focused on bringing down the higher energy costs for American families and our partners stemming from Putin's invasion. That was three months ago. OK, so Pelosi acknowledges that we have high gas prices partially because of the Russian invasion, because because we might not want to accept it. It might not be pleasant, but we have to accept that Vladimir Putin, he has a certain degree of leverage because he controls a certain amount of oil. Right. And his if he presses a certain point, that will cause a pain point for the United States manifested in increased energy and oil prices. And that is what has happened to the extent that they have been laser focused on bringing down energy costs. It hasn't worked. Energy costs, gas costs continue to go up. Russia continues to sell a ton of oil and, and energy to Western Europe. Um, they also are able to kind of shift production around and shift demand around to China. Russia sold three times as much oil to China uh, so far in 2022 than it did in 2021. So the idea that we were going to be able to bleed Russia dry or that it was going to be worth that the calculus worked out for us to assist Ukraine, essentially fight a proxy battle against Russia through the Ukraine that would hurt Russia more than it hurts us, that's a point in favor of it hurting us quite a bit. Vladimir Putin has been able to uh, utilize that as a leverage point, and we have not, the, the Biden administration, the United States has not been able to counteract that and find a way to lower gas prices. So what's the military situation? Absolutely, it has not gone as well for Russia as a lot of people were anticipating. It was kind of embarrassing the first month or two, but they, they haven't given up right? It's like if the idea is, okay, if we arm the Ukraine, if the Ukraine can win this battle of attrition and bleed out the Russians, eventually either the economy is going to collapse, the military is going to lose its morale, or the military is going to accept its defeat, um, and the Ukraine will be able to declare some sort of victory in the United States, incidentally, from that. That also does not seem to be happening. No matter how many men the Russians lose, no matter how many uh, and no matter how many you know mishaps they have on the battlefield, they seem to be coming back. They seem to be able to throw more troops. They 
can keep on recruiting more troops, creating more arms and equipment, and they can keep going. And it seems to be working out. Eventually, the Ukra- it, it seems that they are wearing down the Ukrainian defense forces, which are aided by $54 billion in aid from the United States. That's $54 billion. That's an insane amount of money. The United States has made a $54 billion, well, if you want to add oil prices to it, a $54 mil- billion dollars out the door, plus the increase in oil costs, that is what we are risking, what we put at risk by not trying to aim this conflict to to some sort of resolution. Because we don't seem to have any interest. We don't seem to be making any efforts towards a resolution whatsoever. We're accepting, hey, we would like to support the Ukraine. We would like, ideally, you know, in a perfect world, we would be able to fight this proxy war and win it without significant cost to us, but doesn't seem to be working out. It seems that the Russians, it seems that Putin, for better or for worse, once again, it's not my preference, it just seems to be reality that he has more endurance, that the Russians have more stomach for this fight than the Ukrainians in the United States do for a variety of reasons, but that seems to be the reality. And so it's a tough pill to swallow, and also, you know, particularly after things seem so promising that the Ukraine did put up such stiff military resistance that in the long run, if you stretch this timeline out long enough, things might not fall in our favor here. So Rostow that in the New York Times, he wrote a piece on this acknowledging both the good, the bad, and the ugly, said we can't be Ukraine hawks forever, that essentially acknowledging time is on Putin's side. We don't have the stomach for this to drag on. This has to come to some sort of resolution for us. But Vladimir Putin doesn't, he doesn't, we, we people were assuming that things were going to start looking bleak for him, that the Russian people were going to turn against him, that he was going to accept that his military wasn't up to the task, that the ruble was going to collapse. These things, unfortunately, have not happened. So doubt that gives the trajectory here. Doubt that starts off. I was not a Ukraine hawk before the war came. I felt the United States has overextended itself with its half open door policy around NATO membership and that eastern Ukraine at least wasn't defensible against Russian aggression without a full scale American military commitment. Sending arms to Kiev probably made sense, but as a means of eventually bogging down a Russian incursion, not stopping it outright. The war itself has defied those expectations. The hawks were proven right about Ukraine's simple capacity to fight. They were proven right that American arms could actually help blunt a Russian invasion, not just create an insurgency behind its lines. So, as he acknowledges, the initial response, it defied certain expectations. It was a data point that we should get involved on the side of the Ukrainians and help them fend off the Russians. And their psychological read on Vladimir Putin has been partly vindicated as well. His choices suggest a man motivated as much by imperial restoration as by anti, anti-NATO defensivism. So that's about, you know, does Putin, are, are his plans just for the Ukraine or does he have grander plans? And I don't think there's necessarily, uh, I think the jury's still out on that one because, you know, I think he's at least understood that, hey, his military, they might be able to salvage a win here in the Ukraine, but they're, they're not up to task of going and attacking other countries that get closer and closer to the NATO firewall. So as death, it goes on in the realm of practical policy to date, I have joined the Hawks. Our military support for Ukraine has worked. We have safeguarded a sovereign nation and weakened a rival without dangerous escalation from the Russian side. OK, fair enough. Those things all seem to be true, but you drag the timeline out longer as he goes on. Yet, when I read the broader theories of hawkish commentators, their ideas about America's strategic vision and what kind of endgame we should be seeking in the war, I still find myself baffled by their confidence and absolutism. What what's our endgame here? Where is this all going? For all their defensive successes, we have not yet established that Ukraine's military can regain significant amounts of territory in the country's south and east. So listen, yes, they were able to fend off uh, Kiev and some of the other biggest cities, but the Russians, they'll be satisfied with just carving out a little bit of territory in the south and the east. And that seems to be what they're doing. They're taking over the Donbass region. They seem to be operating, you know, they've kind of recovered from some of their initial embarrassment um, and mishaps, and they seem to be performing adequately at this time. And the uh, Ukrainians only have so many resources left, even with our $54 billion. Doubt that then goes on to some of the risks for the United States. Our plan cannot be to continue writing countless checks while tiptoeing modestly around the Ukrainians and letting them dictate the ends to which our guns and weaponry are used. The United States is an embattled global hegemon facing threats more significant than Russia. We are also an internally divided country led by an unpopular president whose majorities may be poised for political collapse. So if Kiev and Moscow are headed for a multi-year or even multi-decade frozen conflict, we will need to push Ukraine towards its most realistic rather than its most ambitious military strategy. And just as urgently, we will need to shift some of the burden for supporting Kiev from our own budget to our European allies. I don't see, I mean, that all sounds pretty sensible to me. We can't keep on doing this forever. What happens when $54 billion runs out? What happens if Vladimir Putin, because, hey, the Russians once again, for better, for worse, not how we see things. He values life less. The Russians punish him for their casualties 
far less than our our citizens would punish our politicians for American casualties. They don't see things the same way that we see them. So it seems like he has more stomach for a longer fight. So the longer this goes on, the more it plays to Putin and the less options it gives the United States. So once again, where's the end game? How are we finding an off ramp here? Because I mean, do we want $7 gas? Do we want $5 average gas and $7 in the higher markets forever? Because that seems to be where it's headed. Where are we going to be able to find other oil sources? I mean, if we may Maintain this if the United, if the Russia. So if this paradigm, if this rubric is is maintained, where the Russians are able to sell to India, to China, they still have Europe by the balls, and we can't really unwind ourselves from them. I mean, this is our new reality, and it's not a good one. What happens with a landslide in the other direction in November? Joe, by the Biden administration, isn't going to be able to keep this up. So it's all aiming towards all an indicator that we have to start trying to find a resolution to this conflict, and it's going to be one that's that's not perfect. I think it's going to have to be one where Vladimir Putin gets to declare at least some partial victory. Victory, and we have to start getting prepared for that one. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe because it's quieted down around the Russia issue, it won't be as big of a deal. But this is still, you know, this is, like I said, the biggest issue worldwide. I mean, this was on everyone's mind about three months ago. It's still going on and no one seems to talk about it any longer. They seem to still just bitch and moan about gas prices, which is directly tied to this conflict. So as it lurks in the background, we may have forgotten about this war, but this war has not forgotten about us. So as doubt that finishes off, a good strategic theory needs to assume difficulty, challenge and limits. The danger now is that the practical achievements of our hawkish policy encourage the opposite kind of theorizing, a hubris that squanders our still provisional success. Realism, folks, we got to be realistic about foreign policy, about our capabilities, the cost and benefits of them. And that's the type of sober thinking that needs to return on this Russia situation or else we're going to be paying seven, eight dollars for gas for the foreseeable future. Okay, so a friend of the program was in the news this week, Dr. Peter Navarro. He was top economic advisor to President Trump, uh, head of his China trade policy and actually critical to the coronavirus response and Operation Warp Speed in terms of getting the vaccine up and running and someone who I think has done great work on behalf of this country and is a good guy. Um, Peter Navarro, I haven't loved, you know, his his take and his response on the uh, on, you know, Donald Trump's claims of election fraud and January 6th. But listen, these are opinions he's entitled to have. His opinion, I don't find them anything that anathema. And if there's anything I could say about Navarro is that he tries to have his opinions grounded in some sort of reality and fact. And I think he's made an attempt in that regard as well, even though I disagree with him on the election. Um, So Peter Navarro was arrested uh, on federal charges by the Department of Justice this week. So there's a congressional committee looking into January 6th and the Capitol riot, and they've subpoenaed Peter Navarro, not of any specific evidence that he was uh, a motivating factor, an instigator in the Capitol riot, or somehow convinced Donald Trump to take his role into whatever, and we'll get to that in a second, whatever his role was in inciting that Capitol riot. But he was a president, he's a friend of, uh, he's essentially a friendly party to Trump, a supporter of Trump, an advisor to Trump. And it is just assumed that he has relevant communications that need to be brought in front of uh, the congressional committee. So he was served with a, a subpoena. He rejected the subpoena. He, he and was ruled in contempt of the committee, and he was a arrested um, and now criminal charges are being brought against him and then you question okay wait is this legitimate is this typical is this customary so one i mean there's a question at two this is not a a, a court this is not a judiciary this is not a court of law this is a congressional committee do they have the right to send people to jail for not uh for not complying with subpoenas that's something that's up for discussion that's something that peter navarro already had sued before he was arrested he had sued uh, uh to reject the subpoena so and put that question up to the judiciary which is supposed to under the balance of powers the ju- judiciary is supposed to have the right to determine the legal legality and the constitutionality of things such as this. But the Department of Justice decided to go ahead and arrest him. Um, and not even, you know, the, a lot of these types of situations, you alert the the uh, you, you alert the accused ahead of time and you give them the opportunity to submit to the court. And Peter Navarro afterwards said, listen, I live in D.C. I live right near the FBI. Had you asked me to submit, I would have I would have done so. But no, they went and kind of made a show of it in arresting him. And this is a, some I think he's a 70 year old man um, and locking up and locking him up in prison shackles and putting him in solitary confinement. This is what they did to this guy. And on the one hand, hey, I'm in favor of complying with subpoenas. Um, Navarro is asserting executive privilege uh, on behalf half of Donald Trump that these 
communications with Trump are protected because it, Donald Trump has executive privilege. It's pretty much, you know, it's, uh, unlikely anyone would challenge that. And his stance and his his position is that he has executive privilege as an extension of his communications with Trump. So he should have his day in a court of law on that. And I think it's pretty questionable why they went ahead and arrested him. Um, it, does this happen often? Actually, P, uh, Steve Bannon, another person, Steve Bannon wasn't even a member of Donald Trump's administration on January 6th. But once again, because he's supportive of Donald Trump, um, apparently the Department of Justice thinks there's legal standing to subpoena him for the committee and arrest him and file criminal charges because he did not comply with the subpoena. This has not happened since 1983. So it's not unprecedented, but it, it happens incredibly rarely. And this seems pretty partisan. This seems like a bit of utilizing the Department of Justice because the Capitol riot was so, you know, was so despicable because of the gravity of the situation. Using that to kind of take it out on your political enemies. I'm not so sure this has legal standing. Um, so I don't know. I'm going to reach out to Peter. Hopefully that, you know, he has the funds and the capabilities to mount a legal defense. Um, he, like everybody else has the right to, you know, to due process. And I hope that that is observed here and he is treated properly. Um, while I do understand, you know, I do lean in the direction of him complying with the subpoena and uh, and him following that rule, even if I think this is a bit of a partisan witch hunt. So that all kind of goes back to the, the notion of, you know, what, to what extent was Donald Trump responsible for the Capitol riot because while I don't think that he directly incited it, you know, he he kind of stirred up that crowd. The crowd was there because of him. He used irresponsible language and kind of I don't think he wanted to see happen. I don't think it, it in any way deliberately intended for there to be a riot, but he kind of played with fire and he got burnt and I can't really feel bad. I don't really have any sympathy for Donald Trump in that regard. He spoke and acted very recklessly. But there's always the question of those are those who speak recklessly in a direction responsible for crazy people who follow them and taking crazy actions because that's kind of what, what happened with the Capitol riot. So this one actually happened on Wednesday. Someone tried to plan on assassinating a Supreme Court justice and taking quite a few steps towards it. Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. So man, Nicholas John Roski, 26, a man from California, so he was upset about the shooting in Uvalde, Texas and impending decisions on abortion and guns and traveled to Justice Kavanaugh's home with uh, any variety with an arsenal of weapons weaponry with the intent to assassinate him. So let's check this one out. Uh, Roski was charged with attempted murder after two U.S. deputy marshals saw him step out of a taxi cab in front of the justice's house. Um, there was security in front of Kavanaugh's house. You want to know why? There's been a bunch of threats and a bunch of protests since the abortion ruling, the preliminary ruling on abortion was leaked a couple months back. So there seems to be some consequences to violating the personal space of a Supreme Court justice because of uh, constitutional decisions that you don't like. You don't like how the court is ruling on abortion, so you get to go and threaten and intimidate and put uh, invade the personal and family space of a Supreme Court justice. Now there seems to be security in front of the justice's house in order to ward off, you know, any attempts from crazies like that. But there seems to be people stepping beyond the bounds of what is reasonable in in kind of attacking and intimidating Supreme Court justices and other political actors. And that seems to can we connect that behavior to the outright crazies who then go with an arsenal? It seems that this guy had a tactical chest rig, a tactical knife, a pistol, two magazines, ammunition, pepper spray, zip ties, a hammer, a screwdriver, a nail punch, a crowbar. It goes on and on. So um, there seems, and it's kind of odd that uh, Brett Kavanaugh was chosen out of all the conservative justices. We remember the shit show around Brett Kavanaugh's Supreme Court nomination where, you know, there was an accusation from his childhood when he was something like 15 at a high school party about his behavior that a lot of doubt was cast on these accusations. But even if, you know, something that may, even if true, maybe, w maybe would have disqualified a person from the Supreme Court, but didn't seem to kind of warrant the many death threats, the duress, the the harassment of his family that he was put through in response to those accusations. So it seems like you can kind of draw a bit of a direct line from all the attacks, all the smears against Brett Kavanaugh and the fact that someone showed up on his doorstep today with the intent to kill him and a bunch of weapons to do so and was only stopped by the security was that was there. Right. So there's kind of a, a moral and phil philosophical question of when you smear and attack and demonize people, when you speak in a point to direction in a certain manner about people or about situations 
situations and then the craziest amongst us then act upon that in a way that can be harmful in a violent in a violent manner you know who has responsibility for the reckless t- for the reckless discussion right do the the uh do the liberal interest groups that posted justice kavanaugh's home address on the internet recently do they bear any responsibility for what transpired today um does donald trump bear to what extent does he re- bear responsibility for january 6 this is a question that unfortunately we have to struggle with because it keeps on happening this is the type of thing that didn't used to happen very often but now in such a polarized in such a heated environment we have to continually look to blame and figure out and point the finger at who's speaking who is harassing somebody who is harassing a public figure or demonizing a public figure and speaking in, in uh, about them in a way that makes them look like a true and utter threat to society then crazy people act on that type of insinuation and take it too far and things get out of hand and chaotic and violent right this unfor- this is an unfortunate characteristic and feature of modern American life so thankfully Nicholas John Roski was stopped before he was able to uh, visit any violence upon Brett Kavanaugh and or his family but it is an odd this is, seems to be a pretty big event this is a Supreme Court justice someone tried to assassinate a Supreme Court justice and it got so far as to getting to their person the, about a block away from their personal residence and I don't know it, ask me literally anyone find me on social media and message me had you heard about this incident before you listened to it on this podcast am I the first person to inform you that this thing happened because the news doesn't seem to really be covering it so Nate Silver one of the few thoughtful and professional mainstream journalists left he even acknowledged like why uh, is nobody covering the story I mean he mentioned that you know he doesn't agree with blaming those who le- those uh, who leaked his address uh, Kavanaugh's address or leaked the uh, abortion decision for this act of this crazy person but yeah he said yeah it's sort of crazy that it's not being treated as a bigger story there's often more bias in which stories are deemed to be salient than how they're written about so I mean Nate Silver is willing to acknowledge it like wait a second this seems to be a pretty newsworthy event think about if a Donald Trump supporter wearing a MAGA hat had been caught outside the home of Justice Sotomayor of contingent uh, Kentaji Jackson Brown or one of the liberal justices and if a Donald Trump supporter had been caught uh, with a plan and weapons to assassinate them if that would be a big story would that make the cover of the news pretty sure everyone would be screaming bloody murder about it this is an odd hypocrisy in this and once again I'd love I am, would really do have the objective to try to call balls and strikes and be neutral here but if you're a neutral observer of this as Nate Silver is attempting to be here and I think succeeding you realize that this is completely asymmetrical that this is completely imbalanced and it's not doing anyone a service that we've kind of demonized and that essentially any no no anything bad that happens to conservative public figures or politicians or Supreme Court justices is deemed you know not to be such a big deal right whether it's Peter Navarro being somewhat abused by the legal system in the Department of Justice or Brett Kavanaugh having someone come into his house with a freaking arsenal looking to assassinate him and maybe his family so more bad omens more bad juju in American society how are we going to turn it around? I'm not necessarily sure. As you come to this podcast every week, I try to work through these issues and see, all right, how, how can we fix this? How can we right the ship, take down the temperature a little bit? I don't know. Anyone who's got any thoughts, please submit them. Send them to me on social media. Um, would love to hear from all of you. This has been The Prevailing Narrative. Everybody have a great week. I am Matt Belinsky. Once again, you can listen and subscribe to The Prevailing Narrative on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening right now. Make sure to follow me on my socials at Matt Belinsky, M-A-T-T-B-I-L-I-N-S-K-Y. The Prevailing Narrative is a Cavalry Audio production in association with iHeartRadio. Produced by Brandon Morgan, executive produced by Dana Brunetti and Keegan Rosenberger. For Cavalry Audio, I'm Matt Belinsky.